Thank you very much. I would just like to first thank everyone who put this workshop together. It has been absolutely fantastic. <laughs> they make it look so easy, and it isn't. So um, I'm from Bog Tower Gardens, as she mentioned. And we have a rare plant conservation program at the gardens that began in 1986. And so I'd like to talk about the importance of our managed lands to endemic plant species in Florida. So a little background. Bach Tower Gardens is one of 39 institutions in the United States that is a member of the Center for Plant Conservation. And basically, it's, a, it's a botanic gardens, it's scientific institutions, it's research facilities that have formed a network to be like the Noah's Ark for endangered plant species in the United States. So we focus on threatened and endangered listed plant species. And we have um, facilities where we collect and source seeds of rare plants. We also have living collections. And we use these collections to um, engage in restoration projects where we reintroduce po plant populations onto protected lands <clears throat> that will remain protected into the future. Oops. So when I talk about plant uh, endemic plant species, and endemism means that these species occur here in Florida and nowhere else in the world. And because of our unique geography and natural history, um, we have a high degree of endemism in Florida. So long time ago, when sea level is much higher than it is now, we had a series of islands in peninsular Florida when everything else was underwater. And this is where you find all of our endemic species. Now, these are also obviously favorite spots for railroads and roads and homes and businesses so, and agriculture. So um, we've lost so much of this habitat, which is itself now rare, um, that that's why we have so many threatened and endangered plant species. In the scrub community alone, we have 29 federally listed endemic plant species. And again, these are species that occur here in Florida and nowhere else in the world. So at Bach Tower Gardens, we have all of these species under curation. And we also have special projects for a number of these species uh, when we can get funding to reintroduce them into the wild. So the scrub community itself is uh, critically imperiled. It's r globally ranked G2. Uh, with G1 being the most imperiled ranking. Although I would tend to disagree with that in some locations. In central Florida, I would consider the scrub community G1, S1, S being your state rank. So here's an overview of the, obviously the Charlotte, Charlotte Harbor watersheds. And there's two endemic plant species that we're working on within this area that I would like to focus on just to give you an example of the work we do. So Chrysopsis floridana, or Florida golden aster, is one of these species. It is a short-lived perennial species that blooms in the autumn. It's blooming now, in fact. And it occurs in scrub habitats. Now, this is only the southern part of its range. Its natural historical range actually goes a little farther north into Pinellas and Hillsborough counties. But these are the sites that um, I was going to focus on for this talk because some of them occur within the, the watersheds of um, Charlotte Harbor. So two of those sites, Paynes Creek Historic State Park and Duet Preserve, um, are reintroductions. And they're reintroductions on managed, protected lands here in central Florida. And um, they're critically important, to, not just to water quality, but to the preservation of our, of our rare species. You'll also notice uh, Bunker Hill, that's another reintroduction site. Cordell, which is actually the South Fork Little Manatee um, site. Another species that we're working on is uh, the scrub lupin, Lupinus eridorum. And this occurs in two, on two ridges in central Florida. The uh, Mount Dora Ridge, which runs from Osceola County through Orlando and ends around Apopka. It also occurs on the Winter Haven Ridge. So this is the northern part of the, the watersheds. And you can see um, Lake Alfred is the northest town in this area. And then Winter Haven is just south of that. 
Um, so two of these populations, the Lake Alfred and the Lake Blue populations, are introduced populations. And then the Lake McLeod population is the largest remaining population of this species. We're down to 10 total populations uh, from 45 in 2003. And that's mostly lost due to development. The Lake McLeod property is a US Fish and Wildlife property. It's about 40 acres. Um, Treb lupin occurs on about half of it. There is also one other population in between Lake McLeod and Lake Blue. I didn't mention it because it occurs on a, a CSX owned property, which is being developed. Uh, they're expanding to put a transfer station in there. I'm pretty sure that we will be able to save. It's a very small population to begin with. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to save it after construction is done, but I didn't want to put it there just in case it doesn't survive and we can't count it anymore. So a brief overview of how we do the work that we do. So uh, our germplasm storage facility at Bach Tower Gardens includes three temperature storage formats. We've got ambient storage, refrigerated, and frozen storage. Then we also send uh, some of our samples to uh, the National Center, Center for Genetic Resources Preservation, which is a USDA facility seed storage lab and germplasm storage lab in Fort Collins, Colorado. And they have an agreement with the Center for Plant Conservation where about 30% of their total collection in that seed storage facility is um, reserved for the Center for Plant Conservation. It's what they call a lockbox agreement. Uh, the USDA can't go in and pull germplasm for use um, in, in uh, crop protection. Uh, uh, I just lost the word. Because <laughs> uh, that, that storage facility normally um, uses the germplasm they have stored whenever we have certain crop failures, whether it's insects, disease, what have you. That's, that's where we go to pull germplasm to rescue our, our food crops. But even though a lot of our rare species are related to our food crops, that lockbox keeps those seeds protected for use only for conservation measures. We also have a living collection. We have, you see in the photo, we have uh, 60 conservation beds where we grow living um, samples of a lot of our, our plant species. Some of these species, we can't save seeds because they're what we call recalcitrant. They have to be sown immediately or they, or they rapidly lose viability. Now, we are doing some research in concert with NCGRP to test different um, flash freezing methods. And it all, it all has to do with the lipid or fat content of the seeds, how they can be properly frozen. There's certain procedures you can go through with some seeds, but that research is ongoing. And there's still a lot of plants that we have to actually have to keep in the living collection to be able to use for reintroduction. So the first thing that we do um, is we have to know where these uh, rare plant populations are located, so we have to survey. And we use, uh, we use old element occurrence records from Florida Natural Areas Inventory. We do GIS surveys so we can identify potential properties where, where these populations, last remaining populations, might be located. Then we obtain permits from landowners in the state of Florida and the federal government to go out and survey and collect seed or germplasm if, if we find a rare plant on the property. Then we bring the plants back into, uh, back into our facility at Bach Tower Gardens, clean, properly dry, and then store. We also run germination trials, both ex situ and in situ, at the greenhouses and in, on site. Um, test viability, test propagation methods. I'll, you know, it's, it's not straightforward as, you know, throw, throw a seed in some soil, water it, and it will grow. A lot of our rare plant species have very specific requirements. They've evolved in environments over millions of years that are, that are very site-specific, and there's communities of species that really require each other in order to prosper. So um, it's actually a lot of work developing propagation protocols for these for these species. And what we do with um, the uh, plants that we grow is that we, we, we database track every single 
seed that we collect, we know where it came from, when it was collected, who the, the landowner or site manager was. And then when um, we do our germination trials, all that, all that is database tracked. Then before the plants go out into the field, they are number tagged and flagged. And that, that follows that plant throughout its whole life so that we know where every plant came from. Then we introduce plants at protected site. This is um, actually Duet Preserve, a Chrysopsis Florida Dana introduction that we did uh, this last year, this past June. And then we measure the success of our introduction efforts by um, monitoring annually. And this tells us a lot. It tells us how successful we were in propagation and outplanting. And again, outplanting is not as simple as let's just throw it in the ground and walk away. Um, some plants uh, have to be transplanted at certain sizes. Too small, they won't grow. Too large, they won't grow. Um, some have to be, like Lupinus aerodorum, has to be transplanted into a, from a peat pot directly into the ground um, because it, it uh, hates root disturbance. So there's all these little trials and tribulations that you have to overcome. So annually, we go out, we monitor, we uh, collect data, uh, survival, is the plant dead, is it alive? The size, we take height and, and width measurements. Um, we record the, the stage. Is it a, a new seedling, an adult? Is it reproductive? If it's reproductive, how many flowering stems do we have? Um, we do uh, seed, uh, seed production estimates, and we do that by sampling certain number of uh, racemes. For example, on, on these plants, they've got racemes where there are seed pods all along the plant. And when, the, um, when they're ripe, the pods dehiss and, and throw the seeds out. So we have to cover the racemes with pollination bags a month before they're due to ripen. And then, you know, when they're ripe, we come back and we clip the whole raceme and, count, uh, and collect the seeds that way. So that's another method we use to um, estimate how many seeds are produced per raceme on average. We use that, um, our monitoring data, to estimate the number of seeds produced um, for the seed bank that year. And then we use that data to track uh, population status and population dynamics over time. Oh, and we also compare, because we, we do survey wild populations as well, so we like to compare wild versus introduced populi populations to see what kind of you know, information we can tease from that. We've also done a lot of, um, lately, microhabitat studies, or really, learning some interesting things about the importance of management in our wild areas. Because, you know, as I said before, these, these species evolved in a specific habitat, and um, decades of fire suppression at a lot of our sites really has um, impacted our wild populations. And um, so when we look at microhabitat data at managed sites, and then we compare it to our introduction sites, it really tells us some important information about what the species composition of the site ideally should be. And we have tons of partners that we work with. You never can have too many partners or too many volunteers. And um, thank you all, and I'll take questions. I did have a question. Is it documented when the last Florida plant species was lost to extinction? I don't know that we've lost one yet. Oh, cool. That's good. And it won't happen on my watch, that's for sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> that's good news.